we both recently read Interview with a Vampire by Anne Rice, which features an immortal character and throws up a number of questions about what immortality might look like. Mm -hmm. And we're really just going to be adding our thoughts into that mix because you have that distinct take take of of Louis, the protagonist, who is quite a morose character, never really happy when he was alive or when he was a Mm. vampire. But then you also have the Lestat character, who's a much more vibrant, in the book, slightly Mm. different to the film, but a much more vibrant character, certainly uh, more violent in the book, Mm. and a much more negative and unpleasant character. But he actually also has the transformation in the book of, at the end of it, being quite a broken, miserable figure, Mm. not quite of the strength almost that some of the other vampires have shown, Mm. which is um, a a point of the vampire story which perhaps people who haven't read the book are not quite aware of. I think it's mentioned in the film, Mm. but it is that a vampire eventually becomes so out of touch with the time that they live in that they give up their immortality, that they no no longer want to to exist on that earth and they mm-hmm. basically, for one of a better expression, rather than walk into the sunset, they walk into the sunrise. Yes, and, yeah. and that's the yeah. end of them. <laughs> the modern take, particularly influenced by Anne Rice, I think, mm. is that your vampire is a miserable negative figure. Well, why would you want to live forever like that? So I'm kind of, like, I want to see a character that revels in perhaps being evil, perhaps just the, the spices of life that you can <laughs> have and experience over time. Xander... Mm-hmm. who is the antagonist of the Dracula illusion. Yeah, he is. Falls into that camp to a degree, much more so than Louis, perhaps. Yeah. Not quite as much as the Lestat of the film, but definitely as much as the Lestat of the book. Uh, so that's probably fair to say without giving too many Yeah, without giving any more away. away. It's, it's a mm. revenge act. His purpose is to get rid of a certain bloodline. Mm. Uh, and, and obviously the individuals within that bloodline that go through the generations. To give himself meaning, he ends up doing violent things. He relishes doing that, and that part of vampirism he takes very seriously. It does come yeah. down to the fact that without a purpose, mm. what is the point of our existence? Yeah. So there might well come a time for Xander where he's killed everybody of that mm. bloodline. Then what would he do? I think that that is part of that, that Anne Rice walk into the sun, mm. sunrise thing is that the mm. vampire becomes out of touch with their time, yeah. out of touch with what humanity now looks like. Okay, so now what? Well, if you don't have an answer to that question, then your time is up. But my own yeah. <clears throat> character's immortality mm. is such that he's, he's not ever going to do that. Mm. He does enjoy life to an extent yeah but he has experienced everything that there could ever be Mm. so he's utterly bored by everything that there is (laughs) i mean he says in his own words i'm a man of simple regularly indulged pleasures and and so basically he's still like he will perform certain acts including just like eating or or drinking or having sex that he Mm. just kind of is now just going through the motions because he just even rather not. It is really hard to get your head around the idea of immortality because Mm. you go, sooner or later humanity has to die out. Mm. What what would an immortal do at that point? point, Is it just going to be the vampires sitting around looking at each other going, whoops. Well, this is the thing about vampires because they can still die it's just significantly harder so i think yeah when humans uh, go then of course yeah well they could feed on other yeah. animals and blood yeah. so maybe Lou, yeah that's Lou true does in, yeah. in for a long time in interview with a vampire he does he yeah he's on, rats and all sorts yeah. isn't he? not all vampire tales have that same you can drink any blood mm. sometimes it is specifically yeah human blood human blood yeah. so they would be in trouble Anne rice's take on it mm. It's quite interesting, but it has left us with so much negativity. We talked in the past mm. about um, Twilight, Edward Cullen, who's kind of a morose figure, mm. and having to go through high school over and over <laughs> and over again. And if you look at the interview with the vampire, sorry to keep bringing that specifically up, but it's just mm. the one that I read more recently, is that, yeah. that Claudia in the book is five or six years old. Mm. So if she... Then in the book lives to be something like about 60-something before she starts showing sort of maturity that Louis doesn't really 
understand is mm. sort of coming from a sort of half human but actually an adult female in that in that body that girl going through school again uh five or six years old but being a 65 70, mm. 67 year old woman that would have to be a horrific experience <laughs> yeah it would be. i think that <laughs> we we talked about edward cullen um and how miserable his experience would be having to go through high school. It's like when you're yeah. so completely out of touch with your time. But would you walk into the sunrise <laughs> if you were a vampire at 20 years old, when you were made a vampire, mm. you would maintain that, the youth, the energy of being a 20-year-old yeah. for your entire existence. So it wouldn't become horrible. Mm. You wouldn't be going... You know, I, I prefer to listen to Beethoven when everybody else is listening, <laughs> yeah. like, in about 20 years to Tupac and play people like that. The, the yeah. contrast there would be really hard for somebody to, to change to, to deal with. Mm. But if you were 20 years old, perhaps it wouldn't. Well, I think also, though, being a vampire, you would have an element of having more energy, wouldn't you? Because they're mm. supposed to have more strength and more power and so forth. So that might sort of come into it. But for how long? Well, this is the thing. The utopia of, of violence and killing, if that's what you get your kicks out of as being a vampire because it's a utopia it would just end at some point wouldn't it you can't have that utopia forever you would make it dystopian somehow well that's an interesting idea isn't it turning the utopia into a dystopia mm. do you think that if you were immortal you might perhaps run out of things to do that would be your normal character would be a good thing mm. and then start to do evil things from a character perspective Xander because his life is made up of good and evil acts I wanted them uh, the readers that is to to like him hate him like him hate him if he had done everything that was good I think unquestionably he would do more evil I really do do you think that he started off as a good person because my, my own mm. personal take with reading him was that his good was performative at the planning stage and then the writing stage I, I thought that Xander was initially a good Christian because that's the setting he, he, he was in and, and the religion dominant religion of the time where he, where he came from but there was something in him that made him ultimately question um, Christianity and that was one of the reasons why Luther who's another character, another vampire in the story is attracted to Xander. There was that potential evil within him that Luther capitalises on by turning him into a vampire. Mm. When I think about the vampire, what I liked uh, from a writer's perspective is the massive expanse of time that you could just dip in and out of, mm. you know, at the different episodes of the vampire's life. And I liked the idea of memories as, as, a, as, a, as a key theme, really, for my for my book and I like the fact that if you are immortal and my vampire has perfect memory um, the, the, the ability to just kind of go into those other places is almost in a sense bringing something to the to the present setting and making that quite stimulating I think that your book does do a pretty good job of the mm. way it jumps through time. There's a degree of authenticity about whichever experience that you're, mm. you happen to be writing about, rather like a snapshot of a certain period. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's, there's a specific, specific memory, as you say. Mm. Uh, this moment leads to the present because, and you mm. start to see the parallels. And it is quite clever in the way it's put together, but mm. it's something that you're saying about having perfect memory um, yeah. Just to get off the Anne Rice for a couple of minutes, I'll talk about <laughs> Robert Heinlein for a change. Yeah, yeah. Um, in that he, Who's that? <laughs> his, his character of Methuselah mm. in Methuselah's Children, no, it's not Methuselah, it's Lazarus Long in Methuselah's mm. Children, he was part of a genetic program mm. to breed longer lived humans. But what he's starting to find as he becomes old for his type of human is that his memory's starting to go. Right. And that his body was only built to last for a certain amount of time. He's not. But if he was a vampire, there still could be that your, your energy has to be spent maintaining a body that should not mm. exist that long. It would break down. And therefore, parts of you as a vampire might even start to fail mm. with an immortal character. You could sort of play with superpowers. For my character, the only superpower he has is that he is immortal. But your vampire doesn't have the traditional... Yeah. He doesn't have the, the full gamut, if you like, of the Bram Stoker mm. yeah. Dracula. It was not to do away with the whole 
mythology of of vampires and, and so forth but the idea to me that a vampire couldn't go out in the sunlight or couldn't be near garlic or or could only enter a, uh, an abode if, if they were invited. There were some things like that that didn't sit well with my vampire. The myth is broad enough and tough enough to be able to have different mm. types of vampires in. Your book, if we may bring it up again... Yeah, what's it come, called? <laughs> it comes up with some mythology of its own, mm. particularly around Whitby... And around Bram Stoker, the, the creation of vampire has mm. made the name of Bram Stoker a, a, thing, a thing of myth itself. And, yeah, I suppose and almost, it has, really, and the yeah. name has developed an immortality. So why Bram Stoker? Why have him in my book? Yeah. When I was doing my research, it took me through 17th and 18th centuries uh, in, in Eastern Europe and how the vampire sort of transpired from there. And then it took me through to... Um, early sort of poetry there's a there's snippets of vampires being in Byron's poems and so forth and when you do get to Bram Stoker I think that's when it really sort of took off in, mm. in a huge way there was a really great quote in one of the books I was reading and it says basically that all things vampire are looked through the lens of Dracula so all things that relate to vampires will probably at some point be compared with Dracula mm. when you were writing did you mm. consider any other immortal characters where you strictly focused on the vampire? This might sound very strange in a way to link the two, but it does link in because one of my favourite writers is Kazuo Ishiguro, and I love Remains of the Day. And as you know, you've read that, the narrator uh, narrates different episodes of his life. That method of storytelling sort of fascinated me straight away, um, but that in turn links into the vampire's episodic memory or, or, mm. or certainly delineation of that in the story. So I, I would say that that was probably a big influence on how to tell the story. Yeah. But it's interesting that you bring up uh, Remains of the Day because Stevens yeah. exists in that book through a number of different periods. Yes. But doesn't radically change. No, that's true. Be, but yeah. the, the difference being that the, the change of anything that he experiences mm. is he gradually comes to regret yes. choices of the past. Mm. That clearly was not on your mind, perhaps, <laughs> because Xander shows no regret. He's no. he's much more like the Lestat, if you want to compare him to, yeah. and rise, of the film than the Lestat of the book. Mm. He um, doesn't have regrets as such, but he's... At times he is ambivalent, I think, towards humanity. There are times where he he uh, loves humanity, he hates humanity. Uh, again, that was kind of designed by me to try and uh, poke people in one direction to feel one thing and then make them hopefully feel another at a different stage in the narrative. And I think the evil he does do... There is one one character whom he relates to significantly and I think that does upset his if you want sort of domineering evil personality and mm. I think that sort of weakens him a little bit it must be as an immortal extremely difficult mm. to watch short-lived people live and die yeah there is one episode in in Xander's which is quite mm. a big part of the book where it's really quite delicately handled that mm. that balance between I like having you around. Yeah. But your useful purpose to me is up. It's gone. That's right. Yeah. That's There's right. a degree of cold bloodedness mm. about that, mm. which contrasts really well, with, I thought, with the warm bloodedness of their, the times where they actually worked, mm. done and worked together. Yeah. Yeah. That's Again, right. It's yeah. Sort of a, a way of phrasing it to avoid spoilers. Yeah. How, how do you think an immortal could cope? You must experience love. You must experience friendships. Mm. How, do you, how do you cope with that loss on that scale? Yeah, I, I think it would be deeply, from my perspective as a human being, you know, I think that would be deeply, deeply troubling to continually see, uh, obviously, the people who you love and friends and so forth just sort of go. I don't know if you would ever get used to that feeling. You do think about it. You think, what would it look like? Um, John Car Carpenter, when he made the Vampires film, mm. pointing over there, because I've got the book that the film mm -hmm. is based on over there, 
talked about how you start to think about immortality as you get older. Mm. But as I said, being a school teacher and around young people mm. who are brilliant mm. actually is invigorating. Mm. You do feel like there's energy given to you, almost like a vampire, yeah, from just yeah. experiencing that being surprised, being yeah. uh, amazed, having somebody just sort of come up with something and you're like, where did that come from? Mm. From a 12 year old. Mm. So there is, it's almost like being a school teacher is the metaphor for being a vampire yeah. and sucking <laughs> life. Hopefully not actually taking life from them, but I'm gaining life yeah. by experiencing it through from the their enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked about in the past, just mm. generally pop culture, mm -hmm. that there's nothing new. We've seen it all before. It's all yeah. the same sort of stuff redone. And they're going to bring this back to the, the vampire mm. briefly with a discussion of what sort of state do you think the vampire genre is in, in film and in TV, uh, book? The main idea for my book was thinking how would a vampire feel about, say, the last hundred years of vampire representation in literature uh, and, and film. Um, now, I've not seen anywhere near as, as much as what is out there, um, but what I have seen is often, I would say, quite disappointing. And I think from a vampire perspective, Xander's perspective, you would undoubtedly conclude that people's attempts haven't been great. If you look at Nosferatu, I imagine if you're a film student and you're looking at the bones of a film and its um, impact on filming and techniques of scene setting, you'll probably think that's, that's an absolute masterpiece. But from a vampire's point of view, if you look at a picture of Nosferatu, he's really grotesque and he's equated with rats and so forth. Um, there's elements of Dracula, the Coppola's version of Dracula. As a, as a film viewer, that I just think, how can this have garnered such great, great following? Because from my uh, perspective, I didn't really enjoy it at all. But taking that forward, uh, films like Twilight, obviously it's, it's geared towards a, a certain demographic. You know, you've got the school setting, you've got the very young people, the romance and so forth. It's just another way to tell a roman romantic story, isn't it? Have vampires. Taking it collectively, it seems to me to be quite disappointing, which is really hard to say because I know vampires and Dracula particularly have a huge, huge following. But that was why I wanted to attempt something different, to have <laughs> have this vampire reflect on kind of all of that stuff. Not to just dismiss it completely, um, but just to sort of think, actually, yeah, if I'm a vampire, would I like that? You know, how my image has been used. I almost feel bad for saying it, but I, there's, there's been so many that have just not come up to the mark. And do you feel the same from what you've sampled? I think that the genre is incredibly disappointing. Yeah. That the vast majority of what's out there, be it in film or, or text, is, mm. is not just disappointing, but, but flat out dreadful. Yeah. You look at something like Coppola's Dracula, and, yes. and the fact that it is considered one of the better options. And yeah. I, I struggle, mm. even as much of a fan of the book of vampires as mm. I am, and it's not a terrible film, I struggle to think that... that I would say, oh, that's not any better than a 6 out of 10, but mm -hmm. it's one of the better efforts in the genre. Yeah. Coppola's Dracula it, it didn't help the genre no. in that we have Winona Ryder and Keanu Reeves in that film, and neither one of them can act the role they're being asked to, to yes. act. Yeah. They are, you know, you look at Anthony Hopkins, Gary Oldman, they do just fine. Yeah. But Keanu Reeves and Winona Ryder are absolutely terrible in that film. Mm. But because they're good to look at, it kind of ushered in the Buffy generation of vampires. Yeah, it's true. Of, we're yeah. teenagers. We're the and, teenage and right, early yeah. 20s. Yeah. And I don't mind Buffy. It's, it's an entertaining show. Mm. It, it would be a prime example of being detached from your time if you were a vampire and you watched that because you'd be like, what in God's name is this? Mm. I, I, I struggle to think of something that's portrayed it in a sensible way mm. and still managed to tell an interesting story as well because you look at the, the thing with Bram Stoker's Dracula the book mm. and the film that it, Coppola made of it is that they both feel really really long yes and that was something yeah. that I said about Anne Rice's 
interview with a vampire as well is that it feels really long mm. and that's not oh you're getting good value for your money long yeah that's just this is a chore to read at yeah. times and I want it to be over or it's a chore to watch at times mm. and I would rather it just got on with it a bit quicker where where, where are we going where where are yeah. we going to turn to the next actual refreshing and original and new take mm. on this genre yeah the genre is immortal back mm. to the theme of the video yeah but, absolutely yeah, yeah and but it is just keeps being a product of our time you mentioned Nosferatu but at least yep. that aged through the ages mm. and remained a degree of of interest in it of quality it did something new or different yes yeah I, do, I, I wonder if people will give up the immortality of that genre mm. for a new take mm. and whether we're alone here going this genre is dull <laughs> yeah. and it needs new blood we're probably <laughs> we're probably in a minority I would say mm. but there's obviously uh, the, the paranormal kind of romance which is maybe what's um, hijacked the vampire genre and it's all about that now I mean going back to Nosferatu there and, and, the, and the filming of it it was completely original it used chiaroscuro it, lighting in a very very unique and interesting way but as for the perhaps the way a vampire perceives that story not necessarily my own opinion but the way Xander perceives that story is like you know well, well, look at the, <laughs> the the image of the vampire he looks completely gross you know and one of the early ideas I had was in order to give yourself meaning, touching back on the immortality and, and, and finding things to, 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 to give your life meaning, surely you would gravitate to those people and uh, in culture who were great writers, great artists, great thinkers, and you would gravitate to those. So Xander is a character who, who, who values Dickens, he values art or Van Gogh or somebody, because um, I thought, actually, if you are immortal, then you would gravitate to good sources of entertainment. Not frivolous entertainment, but entertainment that, that's going to give you uh, cause to reflect. I've just tried to think, right, if, you, if, you, if you've lived or, or you're living for a long time, what would you do? You probably would end up going into art galleries. Well, Louis does an interview with a vampire, so you're not alone in thinking yeah. <laughs> that you would be interested in the art of the time. Yeah. And I do think that you would have because your times would be so vast that mm. you would have this miasma of just like yeah, uh, yeah. everything becomes grey mm. that when you did see a light shining mm. through the grey that's something that's a little bit special yeah. that you would be naturally attracted towards it I think you would Xander's other reason for being as we stated earlier is, is, to, is to kill a certain bloodline in the most brutal way that he can. So he's kind of a, a dichotomous character. On the one hand, he, he values great conversation and, and art and, and literature and so forth. And, and then on the other, he want, he is a bit of a evil, evil character, really. I found out actually that that was one of the part that works. He, it yeah. really makes him a likeable character, mm. that he has this degree of culture about him. He sets him apart. In terms of immortality, one of the things I said in my review of Interview with Vampires is that Louis is been alive for a hundred years but he's mm. done nothing with that time mm. nothing at all when you think that Armand would be attracted to that I'm like I really don't see it no no I really <laughs> don't see what the attraction was but for Professor Lovecraft what what he's done is the exact opposite of what you might expect a human being to do he mm. actually considers when he worked as a janitor mm. to be higher than what he's currently doing, which is really badly working as a professor. The, the university is called Sexington University, not because I'm trying to make a play on sex, but because mm. he used to own it. <laughs> and now he's just one professor of many. It's the exact opposite of that compound interest that you, your life would get exponentially better mm. if you just exist long enough. Mm. You will be promoted in a job eventually. You'll be there 10 years, you might not be very good at it, but you've mm. been there long enough that you'll just get the promotion. Mm. And his life is an exact opposite trajectory. And the prophecy machine, the dean, is actively trying to fire him mm. because he's so bad at his job. <laughs> he is as we see in the, in the Zargs, imprisoned on Earth against mm. his will. He doesn't want to be here. But yeah. he, he is most definitely more like a prison movie mm. of like absolute atrophy of, yeah. of just failing and not part of society and not doing anything mm. that would benefit him in any way. You can you imagine prison as an immortal? <laughs> in one of the books, they're like, I'm going to stick another thousand years on your, your prison sentence. Yeah. Like, 
Yeah. <laughs> a thousand years on eternity. It'd be interesting to see. Mm. Um, I know they touched on in Futurama a few times about what happens when the world ends. It's really interesting because when I reflect on what I wrote, I try to conceptualise Xander's world within the kind of the dualistic framework of, of good and evil. And there are parts of the story where he experiences and does evil and there are glimmers of, of hope and good, I think. But with Sexton Lovecraft, I don't think he's in a, a dualistic sort of framework, is he? So that's quite an interesting thing that you've done for him as a character. Let's just keep it good and evil because that just simplifies everything. Is he not responsive to those things? Or he, as you say, he just does not care anymore. So does that mean at one time he did care about... His life story, which is in the Zargs, is based on a friend of mine's life story. Oh, right. Which he, he won't thank me for pointing out. And he, <laughs> and he probably is unaware of that. Yeah, yeah. But, but he was... He was never in love with Kylie, mm. the, the space like that caused the whole thing. Mm. But he realised that she was in a terrible situation, that she was really unhappy at home, mm. and he took her away from that. There was a string of calamities that followed, which involved him being imprisoned on Earth. Mm -hmm. But that was ultimately his motivation was that she was in a bad spot and he wanted to help. But it is all about human warmth. Without that warmth, then I think immortality would just be a race to the sunrise. That's something that with Zandi, I think you did quite well mm. in the, the relationship he has with the protagonist, Robert, mm -hmm. is one of genuine warmth at mm. times. Yes, there's the, the manipulation and, and the, yep. the, the end goal yep. that he has in mind, mm. but it's still a relationship initially at least that feels very warm and, yeah. and, and very human. In terms of trajectory for uh, Sexton Lovecraft he's responding to Riley in, in, a, in a really good way and, and she's a good influence on him so he does actually respond to good but if I think about Xander his trajectory can only end up being bad the revenge story only ever has one ending you have your revenge and then it's then what you have nothing I think that by the time most people are like hitting their 40s, mm. they are looking at people in their 20s and going, what the hell is going yeah, on? Yeah, yeah. So I think that the, the, <laughs> the danger for an immortal living 100 years of being so completely and utterly detached from mm. the time, you would be so out of touch so very quickly mm. that it could be quite dangerous. Mm. So one of the films we've talked about already mm -hmm. briefly was John Carpenter's Vampires. Mm. And in one of the making of materials, he discusses that as he's getting older, he starts to think about becoming a vampire or, or immortality generally mm. a lot more often. Ultimate question, yeah. would you take the offer? I think I would. I do. There's parts of me that think, absolutely not. I think I would. Because I'd be interested in time, I think. I think it would be very, very interesting to just see how time plays out. So for that for that reason, yeah. What about you? I would love to see what's beyond. When you look back at history and you see the enormous progress that's been made in yeah. certain fields and you think, I would love to see what that looks like in mm. 100 or 200 years, which obviously I'm not going to do. Yeah. I don't think so. No. I think I might change my mind if I was sick. Do you know what I mean? One, yeah. like one of the characters in my vampire book yeah. took the offer because they were HIV and it was written at a time where that was much more mm. of a death sentence than it is now. <laughs> but as I'm getting older, what? I don't want to live forever, I just don't want to get old. Mm. So if I could stay current age, and yeah. then when I've just run out of things that I want to do, just go, thank you very much. It's been, <laughs> yeah. it's been quite pleasant at times. Yeah. So I'll, take, I'll take my walk to the sunrise. Absolutely. It's, do you think, though, that if you do live forever, there'll be an element of you just don't value things anymore? You could live the most exciting life you could do travel whatever you whatever you perceive to be the most stimulating thing and you could do that and do that and do that but obviously you'd get bored of that eventually and when then when you've done that a few times over you probably just wouldn't value life anymore when there's nothing left to experience yeah when there's no experience left that you value because as you mm. get older you, i got a few years on you so i kind of reached that point a few times so I'm, I'm just i look at something and go, i'm never doing that again yeah, yeah I'm, I'm old enough to say that i don't want to do that yeah and i'm never going to do it again there's mm. nothing that anyone could say and make me do i'm old and, and curmudgeonly i'm just going to go no i'm not doing it, don't yeah. want to do it which is a great place to be it's, 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 it's nice really in some respect refreshing place to be. it's like being old enough to borrow 
wrong with money off everybody and now you'll <laughs> die before you repay. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah I, I, when, but when there's nothing left to experience, nothing mm. at all, what would be the point? Most of the experiences that we value, I mean, you're going to stop valuing items. What's the point of an item yeah. if you're yeah. immortal? What's the point of an item even if you move around a fair bit? Mm. It's just clutter that you have to shift. Mm. And with the phones and things, people are becoming much more portable. But yes, yeah. Cyborgs. You, <laughs> you stop valuing items, but you still value experiences, mm. I think. Yeah. But Professor Lovecraft's experienced everything. Yeah. So, so it's no wonder, isn't it, what the way is turned yeah. out is because of that. You know, as a, obviously as a writer, you, you, you sometimes will have a character and then you'll have a character list of what they're like, they look like, interests, hobbies. Da, da, da. Did, did you do that for um, Professor Lovecraft? Funnily enough, yeah. I have a record yeah. of all the things that I've ever said that Riley likes yeah. or has done, including things like falling off a skateboard when she was 12 and yeah. you know, had a cut chin and stuff like that. Yeah. Or it's all down it's to good. that degree of specifics and it's really quite long. Yeah. And I have another tab, because it's in a spreadsheet, so mm. I have another tab which is sex note, and I've never written anything in it. <laughs> and that is because... Whatever he wants to do, yeah. he can do. Yeah. And anything that he's done, he has no interest in doing. Mm. So it does, his backstory doesn't matter. Yeah. There are parts of it, like when he rescued Kylie from unpleasant, not abusive, but unpleasant parents, mm. that is just, it is what it is. Mm. So, but, so I didn't need to write that down. So there are little aspects of it, but his, his life is not in any way planned. But, yeah. but Riley's is meticulously planned. Mm. That's, that's interesting. What do you think makes your character interesting to say readers? But if I was to say Xander and just be really succinct about it, I would say that the thing that makes him most interesting is that he is ambivalent towards humanity. He thinks he can do what he likes with with people around him. And then there are times where I think he genuinely does care. So what about Professor Lovecraft? The thing about the Professor Lovecraft as a series Mm. is that it's a little bit of a play on Doctor Who as a series. Mm. And in Doctor Who, you have the immortal Doctor Mm -hmm. as the lead that drives everything and the the associate is called the companion. Mm. And really for me, the Professor Lovecraft just takes that and subverts it. Yeah. In that the immortal drives nothing, mm. does nothing and has no interest in anything <laughs> and is entirely driven by mistakes he makes in the present, mistakes mm. he's made in the past, general laziness that causes problems. Yeah. And it's the companion mm. who drives all of it yeah and that is, so it's a subversion that says although there's an immortal character in there mm. that is the human character that that is the actual focus of the story yeah from a literary point of view mm. now you've committed mm. Xander and robert to yeah. paper yeah and put them out into the world have they achieved their own immortality i would hope so <laughs> but in the face of um, ardent vampire fans he's he's a little bit different so it's 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 one of those things i think where time will mm. will tell i basically i've tried my best so i think you succeeded I yeah do. i hope so i mm. think it's a, a worthy entry to a genre that that needed mm. one i really hope that that it does find an audience out yeah because yeah there's so much dross in that genre there is that a lot. something Taking it seriously, trying to do something a bit different mm. is, is a worthy enterprise in itself. Yeah, thank you very much. My goal is slightly different. Mm. If you think that Xander has achieved immortality in print, I don't necessarily think that Riley needs to live forever. She just needs yeah. to outlive me. I'm more like a, <laughs> I'm more like a parent than a vampire. Yeah. <laughs> as long as that happens, I'm yeah. okay with it. Yeah, yeah. But that does mean I want to get hit by a bus tomorrow. No, no, that's it. You've got more work to do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it too. Good. I have. Absolutely. Hopefully somebody out in YouTube land Hopefully it has, appeal, yeah. has found it enjoyable. Yeah. Did you notice what I did there? I do that at work all the time, and it's so David Brent. I swear <laughs> to God that they're going to be like, oh, you're David doing the yeah. David Brent thing. Yeah. 
<laughs> go for now Bran. that is an immortal character. Go for Bran. Go for yeah. yeah. He will live on and on. Yeah, yeah. that is, is absolutely. We can, <laughs> we can only aim that high. Yeah. Excellent. 